Hey there! Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 246 is titled, Let's Talk Baroque with Dr. Danette McDermott. Are you looking for the perfect flute or piccolo to take your music to the next level? Look no further than the Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company in Plano, Texas. Since 1996, we've been the go-to source for flutists of all levels with an unrivaled selection of flutes, piccolos, low flutes, and head joints from dozens of top makers. But we're more than just a music store. We're your complete resource for everything flute related with sheet music, instrumental accessories, teaching resources, and health information all under one roof. And our in-house staff of experts is always ready to help you find exactly what you need to achieve your musical goals. At the Carolyn Nesma Music Company, we're committed to excellence in all aspects of our business from our top quality products to our friendly personalized service. And with an in-house repair staff certified in all major brands, you can trust us to keep your instruments in top condition for years to come. Follow us on social media to stay up to date on the latest news and events and visit our website at fluteforyou.com to shop our extensive selection of flutes, piccolos, and more. Whether you're a beginner or a seasoned pro, the Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company is your one-stop flute shop. Hi! (laughs) It's so good to see you. Yes, to see and hear, right? Right, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Are you out east? I'm in North Carolina. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I'm on Eastern time. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been helping out with um, Dr. Eldred Spell's studio? Right. Yep. Yeah. I've yeah. been uh, Jane all semester and they're doing a search and going to find someone. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I've been kind of holding down the fort, you might say. Well, they're very lucky to have you. Well, it's it's an honor to step into the shoes of someone like that is kind of uh, scary. But since he was a friend, it took on a whole other, you know, meaning. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. That yeah. The probably, it, it's hard to understand, but that it's amazing the strength of friendship. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, it was kind of tragic, but I guess he, you know, he didn't want to retire, so he didn't have to. <laughs> That's one positive thing about all this, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. There's always a silver lining in tragedy, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of good things. Yeah. Well, that's amazing that you are able to support the studio and be a bridge for them. Right. And I guess it it was just good timing that I had retired. Yeah. (laughs) And was basically free. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It, It was perfect timing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you about your album. And I want to say first and foremost, you know, for the listeners out there who may not know, I studied with Dr. McDermott. She was my mentor and now a friend and a colleague, but she was my flute mentor to help me through my master's program. And I'm indebted to her. And I learned so much from her through that master's program. And I want to say thank you also for continued support post-graduation and how much you've supported Flute360 as well. 
Oh, well, I'm proud of you too. So it works both ways. (laughs) (laughs) Yay. (laughs) No, and it's like, it's this amazing full circle moment for me, you know, because then I go off and be the teacher in which like you and Dr. Luce and Dr. Boyd have planted these beautiful seeds in me throughout, you know, my forming of my career and me as a student. And then I get to go out and be a teacher and then finish up more degrees and come back and we're still in each other's lives. And I wouldn't want it any other way. And now hopefully I can return a small part of what you have given me in supporting you and your amazing album. And we thank you for being here. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm so excited about this project that took years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, yeah. 20. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, yeah. That's phenomenal. So I do want to get into these chart sonatas and your recording and the whole process. But I think before we do that, I should also note that Dr. McDermott and I spoke through episode 14 through Flute 360 five years ago. The listeners, do you remember this? The listeners submitted uh, questions and it was like a Q&A episode. Yes. Uh, gosh, it was five years. <laughs> yeah. Five. <laughs> Wow. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Time flies by. And now we are here talking about Dr. McDermott's amazing new uh, recorded album on these chart sonatas. And before we dive into that, I really want the listeners to know like your background and who you are um, in case anybody is, you know, tuning in and they want to know a little bit more information about you. Sure. I grew up in Michigan. I studied with Irvin Monroe of the Detroit Symphony my last year of high school. I went to Michigan State and earned a performance degree. I did a master's in flute performance at University of Michigan. And then I went to New York and I took private lessons with Renee Siebert. And she was in the New York Philharmonic then. And then I got to North Texas where I did my DMA with Mary Karen Clardy. And I started teaching adjunct at Northwestern State in Louisiana and commuting. (laughs) And then that turned into a full-time job and they did a search and I got the job and the rest is history. It was there for 32 years and I retired last May. And that's how I'm able to teach here in North Carolina. I didn't play the broke flute until I bought one and at a convention in 2014, hmm. uh, but it wasn't until 2015 I really started to learn fingerings and went to the Tafa Music Baroque Institute in Toronto, where people can have an opportunity that our professional on a modern instrument can have an opportunity to learn a Baroque instrument alongside younger people that maybe um, already were playing longer. So um, it's such a great opportunity. And I worked with Claire Guimond there. Um, And then I actually went to Montreal and studied with her where she was living then. And then the Austin Brook Orchestra, uh, our former um, alumni, uh, formed. And so my husband and I started having these concerts. And I I was like, "Well, well, I don't really play this instrument, seriously. But... I started to practice and I got to study with uh, Wilbert Hazelzet, who was in Minneapolis a few summers for a, a Broke Festival. And it was life changing. I was hooked on the instrument. So I think it's important to maybe just know that um, this music of chart is what motivated me to actually learn how to play the instrument which is kind of strange, I know. <laughs> mm. So, but, you know, that's where I could tie in how research, you know, can lead you in different directions. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. So I've only really played the Broke Flute for a little over six years. Well, at least when I recorded the these works, I can say six years. Now it's been another year, but <laughs> who's counting, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And what I hear and just, from the perspective of like being once your student and now on this side of the fence, what I'm amazed with and what a testimony for you to share with the community and with others is you can always reinvent yourself. You can always show up and learn something new. I mean, 
you obviously had a very well-established career. You got your doctorate. You went to teach at NSULA. You were thriving there. And then for you to say, huh, I'm curious. I want to learn this new instrument. You know, I respect that so much. I just didn't think I was too old to learn a new thing. It was scary, but I think that's what I'd like to encourage people to consider, that you can learn new things. Yeah. <laughs> at any age, really. At any age and at any stage. And I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm pretty sure like you going back into being, we're always learning. We're a lifelong student, right? Especially if we are teachers, but you going to a new instrument and putting yourself out there and having courage to learn a new instrument, I'm sure then, well, you've, you've always been empathetic as a teacher, but I'm sure there's even more empathy for your current students because you're sitting in that, in that student seat again. That's right. I kept telling my students, um, I would play for them in studio class. I would say, do you want to hear? I learned part of a Telemann fantasy. I need to try it out. And I would remind them that I was practicing and learning new things and trying to figure out how to play the instrument, the fingerings, the air, articulation, all that. And so I could feel their struggle. Because I think when you play an instrument for so many years, maybe we forget what students feel. Mm -hmm. So I was right there with them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, come on, guys, what's so hard? Just do it, you know? But yeah, to meet them where they are at and to help them, again, I think it just strengthens empathy for any teacher. And that's, it's so, I, I really honor what you did in that and going back and learning another instrument because as professionals, and you being a professional, you could have easily said, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know everything. Right. But for you to say, no, I can still learn. I, I think it's commendable. Right. Well, actually, I'd played the modern flute for 40 years when I got my broke flute. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. See? So, yeah. yeah. Trying to just, you know, reprogram your brain to think a different way. It's like a new language. Oh, for sure. And, um, of course, I did have to stop practicing modern flute at a point to to be able to really uh, get comfortable on this instrument. Oh, interesting. But if if I were younger, I'm sure, you know, the experience would be quite different. But after 40 years of hours of practicing exercises and things in a certain way, patterns that are just second nature, then you're trying to reprogram different fingerings, different airflow, different embouchure. You know, it's so different. Hmm. But there's similarities. So your brain is a little confused. <laughs> I could be different if I picked up a totally different instrument that didn't have much in common with, with the flute. Oh, I see. Yeah. Huh. So then you took lessons in traversal flutes with these experts from different parts of the country. How was that? What was that like? Oh, it was such an amazing experience. Sometimes I couldn't believe that I had lessons with people like Jed Winst and Janet C and Sandra Miller and even Bartold Kurgan, you know, all of the, 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 the best. And it was just a privilege that it worked out. I didn't look for it. I just saw opportunities and took advantage of it. I, I was even went as far as was practicing on a Friday at my house and knew Bartold would be in Minneapolis and had been told, well, you could come and have a lesson on t- Monday if you wanted. He's playing a concert. And I sat there and thought, what am I doing? I can teach myself. I can see if I have enough frequent flyer miles. I can get a ticket. I can go and I can have a lesson with him. So I did. Wow. <laughs> Talk about being impulsive. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, impulsivity is my middle name. (laughs) No, that's amazing. And I, you know, I think, you know, just taking an opportunity and and seizing that moment. If there's a will, there's a way. If you really want to learn something and be a sponge and soak it up from the experts, like you're going to find a way. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's true. Yeah. So. You said that you were kind of pulled towards learning the traversal flute because of the chart sonatas. Right. Can you talk about that? 
Sure. In 1997, well, I had met the Professor Arnos Bork of the Janacek Academy in 1992, but in, and in 1995, we traded places. He came to Northwestern and taught, and I taught at the Janacek Academy. And so we were friends, and I went to visit in 1997, and I was also looking for my relatives because I have Slovak ancestry. And he gave me handwritten copies of these flute sonatas. And he said, now there's another one in, in Italy, in Rome, and here's the theme. And maybe you can get the library to give you a copy because you're American. They won't give me a copy. So I brought these home and I looked at them. And then uh, if you can only imagine, Dr. DeVille, our musicology professor said, oh, I'm taking my choir there. I, I could go to the library and, and try to find the music. So she went <laughs> and they found it for her in, in those times you had to order a microfilm. So she actually saw it, but then she came home and six months later, the microfilm came. So then I prepared an edition and published in two volumes with Little Piper, these <laughs> sonatas. And I thought, okay, well, that's great. And I performed them on recitals. And I thought, well, that's it. Until I started to find more sonatas and more concertos and started writing libraries and getting copies and sorting out some of the, the pieces that were labeled as quants. But there was another copy in another library that was with his name. And I started collecting all of these sonatas. And then I made a thematic hmm. index and self-published it so that people could learn about his music. and. That's when I think I started to get interested in the Baroque flute and wanted to know what would it sound like on the instrument that, and, you know, Chart was the violinist at the court of uh, Frederick the Great in Berlin, and then later went to Mannheim and started out in Dresden, but he also was a flutist and he played in the court uh, opera company, he played flute. <laughs> and hmm. so he wrote flute sonatas and violin sonatas and concertos and so he was both. And so I was intrigued by the fact that he was a flutist. And so I think that led me down the path of learning to play the instrument so that I could experience this music. I never thought I would even be able to play one sonata in public. Mm. Um, you know, I wasn't planning to uh, record them. <laughs> mm. And so I think it was just the doors kept opening for these opportunities. I went to Copenhagen to the library and was able to see two sonatas and found a concerto that I think is, that was listed as anonymous that I think is by chart and I got to play it. I published it. Um, I had to play it actually with the Austin Broke Orchestra on Broke Flute, but I had played it on Modern Flute like five years before. <laughs> mm. But before I knew I was going to ever learn to play Baroque flute. And so those are the things that happened. And then when I went to Minneapolis, that's where I met Leanne Aragusa, who also recorded. So she recorded three sonatas on our CD, and I recorded three. And then we did the triple sonata together. I, I just felt like, well, I don't know if I can do all six. It'll take me longer. <laughs> and mm. I, I to get it, get this um, project done. And and then we were able to record with David Schrader, who was amazing on forte piano. And then, of course, my husband, Doug Bakkenhus, was able to play continuo on Baroque bassoon. So it was a very different color to use forte piano and bassoon. But yeah. I think they it worked really well. So it's unique. It's a different sound. Mm -hmm. So I haven't heard much from people about what they think about that. But I know Frederick the Great had forte pianos. He had... Mm -hmm. At least 10 of them so they were there and they had bassoonists of course <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so we recorded in Chicago and it was such a great experience and <laughs> we had fun we really had fun recording it's tricky with these instruments you've got to worry about temperature and mm -hmm. humidity and and this was during COVID and my husband and I had just had COVID and I got very sick with bronchitis for a few months mm -hmm. and I was just determined I have to get well. I have to be able to record because we had the funding, um, the studio, David secured, the recording engineer, Yuri. So we had it all planned. And, and so we just had to make it happen. 
Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and am I correct to say or to ask, like, these chart sonatas hadn't really been researched very well? Is that correct? That's, that's a good point. I actually was lucky enough to update the New Grove uh, article on him online. And yeah, basically, there are two recordings at, at this time that I knew of on modern flute of some of the sonatas, but not the trio sonata that I've ever found. And then another flutist recorded on Baroque flute some of his other sonatas, but not these sonatas. Okay. So this is the first recording of these sonatas on Baroque flute. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. And with the forte piano bassoon too, which makes it right. different. What a great contribution to the catalog. Right. Thank you for that. Right. Yeah. No, I remember the edition that you had on the chart sonatas when I was there from 2007 to 2009. It was in that binding. And I think that was the little Piper version. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's what I recorded. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So cool. So like you said, you were learning a lot of different things through this recording process because playing on these period instruments is much different than our modern instruments. So besides that lesson that you learned from the process, were there any other lessons that unfolded anything you learned through this recording process? Because this was not your first recording album. You've recorded other flute CDs in the past. Right. Yeah. I recorded with my husband, with a pianist, friend of ours in, um, in Moscow. And yeah, the thing about this style of music that is interesting is, of course, ornamentation. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it can be different every time you play. You can practice certain ways, but then you'll feel something different. And so our keyboard player, David, was he's just amazing how he could ornament. And, and when we did a repeat of a section, he would change what he was doing, and then we would respond to it. And that it's sort of improv, you know, and, and, and so there's, we rehearsed, we, we got there and we rehearsed on a schedule for a few days before we went to the studio to record, but, uh, cause we had to get tempos and the feeling and the tuning and all these things. But I think what was nice about this experience is that until we played and said, okay, I don't need to do it again. <laughs> anything could change from take to take because you mm. could work differently or the way you articulated something or said something. And then it's a conversation. The style of music is, is a conversation between the voices. So everyone is affected by the other player. So that part is really fun. And, and so this was a great group of people to do this with. That's an important aspect, I think. And it's yeah. not about trying to be uh, you know, perfect. It's about the feeling and the affect and the character and the, the mood and the dance movements had to sound like dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, yeah. And the continual players are so important for the style of music. So uh, just the way you know, Doug would play the bassoon line, the left hand of the keyboard, sometimes they would decide the, the keyboard player wouldn't play. Doug would do it. Sometimes they would play it together. And so they had a lot of decisions they had to make. Other things that were really important for Doug, he couldn't switch reads between movements on the same sonata. So he had to keep track of all of his reads because he played seven sonatas. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas, uh, you know, Leanne and I each played four. And so that was that was interesting. And then I used two different flutes. And so I wanted to make sure I used the same flute on one sonata so <laughs> that I didn't um, do another movement, a take of another movement another day and use another flute because the color would be different. I was going to say, so same thing with the reeds. He was being consistent with the reeds to keep the same tone. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. Yeah. No, that's amazing. <laughs> Hey, Flute 360 -er. Are you tired of practicing endlessly with no real guidance or community to support you? Do you dream of taking your flute playing and career to new heights, but you're not sure where to start? Look no further because 
The Flute 360 Accelerator Program is here to help. Our program is designed with the modern day flutist in mind, providing you with the tools and resources you need to succeed in today's music industry. With our mastermind group, masterclass, and pocket coaching, you'll have access to personalized support and guidance every step of the way. Say goodbye to the isolation of practicing alone and hello to a thriving community of like-minded flutists who will support and motivate you. Our Evergreen program allows you to join at any time so you can start accelerating your success as a flutist right now. Don't wait any longer to take your flute playing and career to the next level. Enroll in the Flute 360 Accelerator program today by clicking the link in the show notes below. The next meetup is scheduled for Saturday, May 27th, 2023 from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. Remember, though, you can enroll at any time. We can't wait to see you there. So how long was the recording process all together from like start to finish? And not just the recording process, but the overall like production, even post-production. Oh, okay. Ed- editing and things like that. Well, we recorded Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then all went out for dinner <laughs> and celebrated <laughs> Tuesday. So we didn't, uh, we didn't go real late. And then, you know, it took a while. It's complicated with the, when you first start editing. And so Leanne did the first listen, you know, for the first edits to sort out like what to take out, the which takes, we don't need that one right now, focus on these. And then actually I went and we did together in person, a listen, we listened to then the next group of edits and that was really good to do together in person you know I just drove to her house (laughs) um and um she had a new baby newborn baby and so uh and that was that worked out great and so then it was just a matter of getting you know the recording engineer to finish who was very busy recording all kinds of people and traveling so these things um take time and it's not easy to be patient I think about Mm -hmm. that but it's not Mm -hmm. bad to have a lot of time after you've recorded before you actually hear it because otherwise I think you're still feeling how you felt when you played or thinking that you can change something because you can't um so I I like that and and what my reaction was when the final edit came through was really wow this music is great. I don't listen to it and listen to I'm playing. I I don't hear that. I hear the music. Hmm. And I just really think the music is great music. And Hmm. so, so does, so does Doug. We, we both agree that we, when we listen to it, uh, we're listening to the music and that's why I was motivated to make the recording to work so hard. Yeah. And what I hear you saying that is, you and Doug and the other players probably feel more or less like a vessel, like let the music shine. And we're just, we're the instrument, literally the instrument to let the music have that space so people can enjoy it. Right. Right. Yeah. That it wasn't, it wasn't about me. <laughs> it was about the music. And, and in a way for me, it was like a sort of a circle, you know, of when I started out with this music, publishing it, finding manuscripts, putting together a thematic index, collecting these, updating the New Grove article and identifying manuscripts. I'm still finding them. Yeah. (laughs) I found a violin concerto and I'm working on editing and so people can play it. But, But that's really been my motivation is that, you know, we often just play composers we know. And then if there's a name that's new, we maybe think, oh, well, if they were really good, we would have heard of them by now. Um, oh. I, you know, I, that's what I think I learned when I was in music school and I was young. I, and now I think we're a lot more open-minded about, about that. But I think there's a lot of composers that we don't know about that are, you know, great. Mm-hmm. So let's go off of that notion then. If there is a musician, a flutist listening to this conversation, 
and they have an inkling towards a composer who isn't well known and their music has not been recorded yet. And they feel this pull to get their music out there to the rest of the community. What advice would you give them? I think it's almost an obligation if you discover a composer and you think this is great music, people don't know about it. I feel like it's a responsibility to share it with other people because this poor composer, I I didn't mention this, his name on manuscripts is spelled over 20 different ways. And so part of, I think, his being forgotten somewhat after he died is all the spellings on his manuscripts that are in libraries around the world are so different from each other that people wouldn't know, including the librarians, that it's the same composer. And he's listed in Newgrove under Z. So I did make sure he gets cross-referenced. So when you search and same in IMSLP, I put some manuscripts there so that you would find him if you put in the check spelling of C with the the Mm. Marco or CZ, which is makes the the sound of that mark and his name was often written that way on manuscripts when he was working in Germany. Um, But there are even spellings with T uh, Z or S E H. And the, the, my favorite one starts with a Q. And and so how would people know this is the same person? (laughs) Right. Right. That's a good point. Huh? No, that's amazing. So, by hearing this and hearing your journey through, like, you know, studying him all the way to recording an album of his sonatas within these 20 years, what was, I mean, it's probably hard to say V1, but if you had to pick the top biggest lesson that you learned, what was it? Because that, there are many steps. 20 years is a wide span of research and practice. It was more like 25 now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing I learned, Mm -hmm. you know, I think when I was in graduate school and I was working on my dissertation on Yendrick Feld and I had met him and interviewed him and I, I understood then the value of meeting a composer, understanding how they thought, what their personality was and their music um, took on a different meaning. And I felt like that was such an amazing opportunity I had. And so I always felt really passionately about trying to be the composer's voice the best way we could. Interpret the music, of course, there's different ways, but but put thought into it and learn about who the composer was, where they were coming from, what their world was like, what did they hear, and try to really get that to come through your music. And it's, I, you know, I didn't want to sound like a good flutist when I was playing pieces by different composers. I wanted to sound like that composer. I wanted people to for, <clears throat> actually forget I was playing a flute, <laughs> if that makes any mm. sense. So they, they weren't thinking about what instrument I was playing, but they were, they were hearing the, the music. And so I, I think that by learning to play the traverso, and experience this music on that instrument, I got a lot closer to the composer. And Hmm. to me, that's the most amazing experience of all of this is there would just be moments when I was playing the music. And even when we were recording the music where I would just feel the music in a way that was so special and unique And it was, of course, different than how it would be on a modern flute. But that doesn't mean people shouldn't play it on a modern flute, you know, at all. Because you can still experience a lot of things, you know, even on a modern flute with Baroque music. But for me, I was just really caught by the colors, the expression, the inflection, the articulation, and the ornaments. And Chart was one of those composers where I found manuscripts several maybe of one sonata uh three different copies and mm-hmm. three libraries and three countries with different versions of ornamentation wow so to see that was a learning experience for me wow maybe this was for 
a student, he was writing, showing how to do it because he didn't need to do it for himself. Oh. So that was really an amazing thing to find multiple copies of the same piece in different libraries um, and think about how it got there. And, you know, so I'm still learning from the music, I, I feel like. Yeah. It sounds <laughs> like you are kind of like an Indiana Jones, you know, <laughs> going through all the tunnels and the pathways and finding your chest of gold and the treasures. And that's what comes to mind when I hear you talk about this. Yeah, I guess I'm a wannabe musicologist, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are, though. You are a musicologist because you're going, you're studying history and you're bringing it to light, you know, and why not? I mean, you know, yes, there's the Dr. Mary DeVille's out there who have actually degrees in it, but you're living proof. Like you're actually walking the walk. And like I said, you're bringing this music to life. And that's what musicology is, studying it in depth and learning about the composer. And right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's exactly true. <laughs> yeah. Dr. McDermott slash flute professor slash musicologist. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And I had so many questions as you were talking about that beautiful journey because we're talking about baroque music i think my mind went to me being like a studio teacher and me introducing baroque music to students for the first time are there you know of course my in my head i'm thinking of quants and treatises like that if there's a flutist listening to this and they have no exposure to baroque music at all and they want to get their hands onto something and they're interested in baroque music what would you advise them to do? Start studying like Handel sonatas? What book do they read? Something like that. I, that that's a great question because it can be really intimidating and scary. Mm. Uh, I'm actually teaching a class right now on ornamentation, <laughs> which is a funny thing how that happened too. Well, Quants, of course, is a great source and there's so much information, it can be overwhelming. So you have to read, you know, small sections at a time. Telemann methodical sonatas are a great example of ornamentation because he'll, for the mm -hmm. slow mo movements, he will have the, the, the plain melodic um, structure and you can see the bass line. And then you can see how he ornamented just as an example. Um, so that's a way that you can look at how ornamentation could be. But Quants, you know, in his treatise has these little exercises where you can just play the ornaments that he has there it's it's kind of a fun little game i've had i'm having my class to actually practice these now so you can get used to the language of the mm -hmm. time i think also listening to good recordings of you know great broke flutists and watching the music and just seeing what they're doing is certainly helpful and having a good addition is also important because there's so many additions that are really edited that are putting things, a lot of markings that would not have been there and from treatises as we read them, you know, we don't have recordings. So we can't say, well, they never did this or that because mm. go back and hear how they did it, but we can read about it. And then the music, if we could get close to the original source, whether it be the manuscript, which some are hard to read or a first edition, which we have IMSLP has a lot of things that people can find there, but getting a good edition that will show or, or say what their original source was. So mm. that it's considered, you know, scholarly or there's justification for why they wrote it the way they did, because otherwise things can be so heavily edited. You wouldn't even know <laughs> what it was originally. And, and then it, it really affects articulation and the shape of the notes and the links of the notes and the inflection um the notes shouldn't be even you know they thought that was ugly mm -hmm. they should be the same so that's a, a different way of playing when we spend hours in the practice room trying to play a certain way and now we have to change our thinking for this different style mm -hmm. uh, but it's rhetorical broke music is is imitating speech or dance um, and so just getting, hmm. watching 
broke dance. You can find videos online. I took broke dance. I was lucky enough to do that at these summer um, workshops um, that I was in. And I had some great broke dance teachers. And um, just to feel the, the, the dances when I play the music. It makes a big difference. Not that I would go out in public and dance these dances, but I do show my students and I tell them they can laugh at me. But just to feel how the dances, you know, feel in your body. Yeah. The movement, Good. the basic, the minuet, which isn't hard to dance. Yeah. No, embodying the the feel of the music literally through your body, it, it trans. It transcends beautifully then into you your know, making. You were a dancer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good memory. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I took one semester of traversal flute with Dr. Kim Pineda during tech. And I will say that it was such a great experience because, yes, it's a flute, but you're right. Like how you blow the support system, the fingerings, the timbre. Um, it just feels different. It's a different instrument. And so when you go back to the boom flute and you play Telemann fantasies or you play a Bach piece or a handle to be able to have that experience and try to emulate it the best way you can through the silver flute, you're going to be more successful, I think. Right, right. And I think, you know, there's things that that you can do on the broke flute that you can't do on the modern flute, but there are a lot of things you can do on both. And, and so um, for people to just be open-minded to have an experience, like what you did with the broke flute, that is a great opportunity just to have an experience even um, and not feel like, Oh, I, I don't want to play it in public. So I don't want to do this, but just to see what it feels like hmm. because it changes your idea. Oh, a lot for, of the music, as you found out, I'm sure it's like yeah. a totally thing. And I remember it's funny the first time I had to perform on the broke flute, you know, that was really hard for me at my age of playing modern flute for so many years and feeling like I had a standard for myself of how I should play. And I was standing backstage looking at my broke flute and I said, This is a stick. I'm going out <laughs> on the stage with a stick. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have to be brave. Uh, and yeah, I got, I got past that and I did it again and again and again. I went out to play that stick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's what people are afraid of. They look at it and they, they think, how will I play a piece on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say is, you know, you don't have to kind of put that pressure on yourself right away and go into performance mode and play on stages. Just get your hands on a traversal flute and kind of have like this childlike curiosity in your practice sessions just for you, your, you know, me, myself, and I, just for the experience for you to have during your personal time and your personal right. growth. Right, right. Just in the yeah. privacy of your own home or practice room just to, to try to play a phrase of something to see what it mm -hmm. feels like. Yeah. And a lot of the pieces that I thought were so hard, like the CPE Bach, <laughs> solo flute sonata, once I learned to play traverso, of course, it's not easy to play on traverso. You have to get to a certain level. But once you do, then the music makes so much more sense and it's not so awkward. Um, I even just recently performed the Bach, a jazz Bach uh, E minor flute sonata on a concert and I just had moments when I was playing of realizing some of the passage work the technical passage work makes so much more sense on the broke flute just mm -hmm. the, way, the way the fingers move it, it is not awkward it, it, of course you have to practice and and get to a, a level to be able to to do it but yeah. it it made me realize that on modern flute there were some finger patterns that were just always kind of strange. And of course, <laughs> because yeah. that's not what it was written for. <laughs> that's a really good point. And so, so I think people should be nice to themselves when they're playing the modern flute on some of these great broke pieces. And there's parts that are hard. They should not be so hard on themselves about it because it's, it's a different instrument. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's really great insight. And you won't know that 
if you don't study the traversal flute. <laughs> right. And even if you have an experience, you can still have those aha moments. Yeah. I yeah. love that. So if, again, I'm always trying to bring value to the listener and helping them along their musical journey. If somebody is hearing this and they're like, oh, wow, Dr. McDermott has recorded X amount of albums and I really want to get my musical voice out there. Um, and they want to start and record their own CD, what advice would you give them? Like, how do they even start? Because sometimes 360 listeners will have these great ideas, great ideas, but they don't just breaking it down and knowing like what step one is um, sometimes can be difficult. And right. I, and I empathize with that. Right. So recording projects, the, the first thing you have to find funding <laughs> to pay the musicians, secure a, a place to record. And in our case, we used a studio. So yeah, you have to figure that out. And that was my biggest worry. How will I pay for this? So I was lucky enough to get a professorship through my university that, and I was lucky enough, the musicians were very generous of their time uh, to not need a lot of money <laughs> because, you know, a lot of these projects are, they can be really expensive. I think if mm -hmm. you don't have friends that will help you or believe in the cause, like that it was for a good reason and mm -hmm. um, sort of thing. But then you, you know, you have to also figure out your practicing and you, and you, to be prepared. And I, you know, like I was trying to tell my students here, practicing for a recording session might be different than how you practice for a concert. And, but you also have to realize you can't just have the attitude or I'll just do another take or I'll just play it again or I'll just have the recording engineer fix it because you have to have respect for the other people and everyone gets tired. And mm. so, so you, you, you really have to figure out for you how you need to practice leading up to it. Mm. But so, yeah, you really have to come up with money <laughs> uh, funding <laughs> for the project. And then you have to come up with a schedule and a plan and a place and and the time and have to hope that everything works out and you know for everyone that they can all all carry through with it but in our case we hadn't even rehearsed with David Schrader you know so we fly to Chicago we go rehearse with them and I'm just trusting that it's going to feel comfortable did mm -hmm. I practice the right way did I prepare the right way you know it works all the directions um, and so it was just amazing that it did, that it felt comfortable. But, and then you have to figure out what you're going to do about your, your album cover, your artwork, your program notes, all of that sort of thing. And then if you're going to actually have a physical CD or if it's going to be streamed or, you know, so I have a physical CD because we, we, we got some made. Um, it's beautiful. Not, not everyone wants those. So it's on all kinds of online platforms, uh, more than 20 different things. Um, <laughs> and then it was uh, funded by uh, this professorship. So it's not for sale. It's free <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's part of that. We, we shouldn't sell things that are paid for and that were funded in that way. So uh -huh. it's, that's why it's free, which is also a nice thing that I liked that I was able to say it's free hmm. anybody so you don't have to buy it <laughs> no barriers yeah yeah, yeah. you it's can't offering always, yeah you can't always do that you know people need yeah. to well, that that spend their own money need to be able to get some money back and, and so that's not a, a usual thing but yeah. i guess looking for grants you know they're out yeah. there yeah no, that's great. And not to put you on the spot, but do you know of like websites or resources that mention like grants in order to help the funding of a project like this? Not specifically. It isn't easy, I think, these days to get a grant for recording unless it's unique in some way. You know, I never did look into because I didn't have to, but that would have been the next step. Sometimes since this was Czech music, I might have looked oh. for organizations that would support, you know, Czech oh, smart. music bonds or things like that. But I was lucky the university was able to 
to do this, but yeah, but yeah, that is that is the question. I just don't know about a lot of uh, grants, but there are organizations that do have them, and I know yeah. there are databases you can go to to search. And... Nice. Yeah. No, you don't know this, but it must be the month of talking to flutists who record albums because you are the third 360 guest in a row to have been talking about their recording album process. So like Dr. Jennifer Grimm was talking about how she was getting grants for her album. And then Andreas in New York, he was talking about his Latin based music album. And here you are with a chart. It's like, oh my gosh, it's full circle for me. Everyone is kind of on this like same wavelength of, you know, recording these special pieces. That's great. That yeah. yeah. It's great that people are still recording and that it's easy to hear these things online. We're really lucky. Yeah. And I do want to say, as we're wrapping up this wonderful conversation for the listeners out there, Dr. McDermott has wrote countless of articles on Bell's music. She's a scholar and I'm going to embarrass her because she doesn't (laughs) like, she doesn't like being under the limelight, but she's a scholar on Bell's music. So I know that that's me completely going down another (laughs) rabbit hole and you'll have to come on a third time through Food360 to talk about Feld's music. But if you needed information on his compositions for flute, she has written countless of articles through Flute Talk and through other mediums as well. Right. And and my flute, my flutist um, here at Western Carolina, we performed his castation for nine flutes today. Wow. (laughs) Oh, fine. <laughs> coincidence, isn't that? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to introduce them to his music, so. <laughs> yeah, and I remember so vividly, I think I had just started my studies with you, and maybe that first semester or the second semester, you had tragically found out that he had passed away. Right. I remember that. You were heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we did the we did the concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. We had a we had a Feld themed flute concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. Great memories. Yeah, I miss him. But what yeah. a great experience to know a composer. Hmm. And that influenced you know your study your studies with charts music too, like what you had said earlier. And I've done a lot of Flute 360 interviews where I talk to flutists who are also composers and it shines a totally and it brings a completely different dynamic to the stage, hearing them talk about their works, their life, how they envision and hear their music, because then we as performers get a better sense of who they are and and what they want listeners to hear. And it, it dramatically influences your performance. Right, right. It really does when you make that connection. Yeah, instead of just, you know, growing up thinking, oh, I'm just playing music of people who lived a long time ago. I can't relate to them. Mm. Yeah. It really brings the music to life because then you don't just see the black and white. You're like, oh, Gary Shocker. I'm just going to take him for an example. He's a gentleman in New York and he has all these cats. And if you look at his beautiful, like, New York apartment, and can you imagine the sound bouncing off? off the hard wooden floors. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's, I don't know. And then when you approach the music, it feels like a, another human, well, obviously the composer is a human, but it really feels like the, the human, the composer is speaking through the music. And right. it feels more intimate rather than it being black and white notes right. on a page. Yeah. And that's how I felt about this project, this um, album that we gave this music a new life. You know, we did, we took music that's just in libraries and manuscripts and published by Little Piper by me 20 plus years ago, but and we gave it a new voice in a way. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your contributions with the chart sonatas and everything that you've done for our community. Well, thanks for letting me talk about it. <laughs> oh, anytime. <laughs> I love learning from you and just sitting here and watching you get so excited and passionate about the work that you all have done brings me a lot of joy. And I know the listeners are going to eat up 
your knowledge and your expertise, and they're just going to love the content. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review through your favorite podcast app, such as Apple, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, among others. Thank you. Let's talk about flute.